A hearty and a very warm welcome to our distinguished foreign policy annual lecturer for 2021, Ambassador Dr. Dino Patti Jalal of Indonesia. And I also welcome uh, and recognize uh, Ambassador Gurjeet Singh, our consulting editor on the journal, and who has been very active in arranging this evening's lecture. And I thank him for that. And at the same time, I welcome all our friends, uh, our board members, our editorial staff, our editorial board, and our friends from across uh, the nation and uh, Southeast Asia. And I see the people from other countries in the West as well. And more will be coming in as we begin. Uh, so with, uh, with uh, I shall leave Ambassador Gurjeet Singh to give a formal, detailed introduction to uh, Ambassador Dr. Dino. Uh, and, uh, um, uh, and I shall just give a couple of sentences on the Rising Asia Foundation and the Rising Asia Journal, which are both very new. Uh, both were started in September, October last year. And in this time, the journal has published two issues in the space of since January to now. And the third issue is going to be put into press in uh, September and work is progressing. Our area of focus is looking at the Eastern world. So our focus is east of Calcutta. So we look at all the, you know, the ASEAN and beyond uh, East Asia, Japan, Korea, and of course, China. Uh, and the reason for that is that we have to have a niche. Uh, we, as a new entity, can't take on the world uh, because there are other larger organizations that are better suited to be global, uh, you know, uh, those who have an eye on the world. Our eye is on our niche area, and as Gurjeet himself will agree, uh, he also is pretty keen on, on the fact that we are nuanced enough to look at the northeast of India and the eastern world. So that, in brief, is is the journal. The foundation also conducts a, a raft of charitable work. We shall soon begin giving charitable donations to a couple of colleges and universities in Calcutta. And these are in the nature of uh, um, best essays of the year from students in a higher program uh, at the MA and PhD level. We should also be making donations to certain uh, uh, entities of higher elevated thought, uh, again, charitable donations. And the long term plan is to expand from one journal to at least two, uh, a dedicated foreign policy uh, monthly, uh, as opposed to a three times a year journal, which is scholarly, but a dedicated monthly journal that looks at very active policy oriented issues, uh, which will be updated and refreshed on a weekly basis. And we shall also be publishing books uh, as time goes on. And the time and, and, and our also our plan is to have partnerships with universities in India, universities abroad, and institutions uh, of foreign policy bent in the region. So these are partnerships we envisage going forward. So having said that, I think uh, I shall only add just one more line on, 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 the, on the topic of for today, which I think is so relevant, because the whole engine of Asian growth, which had started with such spectacular promise uh, since Deng Xiaoping and uh, a certain U.S. Foreign Senate Committee, Senate Relations Committee, had mooted the idea of the Asian century in the mid to late 1980s. It's kicked off with great promise, but then it seemed to sputter, uh, you know, with, with, with the crises, uh, economic crises, pandemics, and great mistrust between the larger powers of Asia, on the one hand, and between the predominant power of Asia and the predominant power of the Western world, on the other hand. So all these uh, conflicts that seem to be coming together have raised a question for, for Dr. Dino as to 
will there actually be a nation century? I can only say that there must be and there will be because from my perspective and because I'm a historian and I look at it from the long durée of history, we've had, and this was a historian scholar who said this point that out of the last 20 centuries of the past, 18 have been dominated by Asia. And if, if they haven't quite been Asian centuries, they have been centuries that were powered or that were dominated by or centuries to which contributions were significant by individual or collective Asian powers. So if this were to turn out to be an Asian century, we shall say we saw it coming. So with that, I, I shall leave it open and I once again very, very warmly welcome Ambassador Dino for his sporting spirit and his overall uh, um, at, uh, attitude of conviviality and collegiality. And with that, I hand you over to um, Ambassador Gurjeet Singh with a very short introduction about Gurjeet. He is uh, a stellar ambassador of India who has a foreign service officer a career foreign service officer, pretty much like Ambassador Dino, who also is a career foreign service officer of Indonesia. Uh, Gujit Singh in his long and varied career has worked with great uh, honor and dedication in ASEAN as an ambassador, Indonesia as an ambassador, African Union, Ethiopia and Germany and a few other countries. Uh, and in this, in this time, he's written books delivered lectures and been an insidious worker to promote the interests of uh, the great country of India with its powers. Uh, you know, the overall adherence to Pankishila, uh, which uh, Indonesia and India were partners in, the belief that there must be uh, the five principles of peaceful coexistence, harmony, etc., which have uh, you know, a foreign policy driven by peace harmony, amity, cooperation, which are pretty much the founding touchstones also of ASEAN. So with that brief introduction of uh, Ambassador Gurjeet Singh, I hand it over to Gurjeet Singh, Ambassador, to uh, serve this evening as the chair, a chairman of the entire program. And Gurjeet, over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Harish Mehta. Uh, let me compliment you and your team for the start of the Rising Asia Journal and very quickly going into the uh, conference that you have organized and the first annual diplomatic lecture by the distinguished Dr. Dinopati Jalal. Dr. Jalal, well in Indonesia you call him Dino, you don't call him Dr. Jalal. That's the way Indonesians are. They tend to use first names a lot. Now, Dr. Dinopati Jalal is one of Indonesia's foremost intellectuals and not only on foreign policy but on the development of society. He of course is a distinguished diplomat but he did not allow himself to be extinguished. You know he was a very uh, well-spoken speech writer and spokesman for uh, uh, President uh, SVY and he was after being ambassador to the US he also was the deputy foreign minister during my time when the government changed Dino went out of government but focused more time on the foreign policy community of Indonesia now this is a fantastic initiative where he brings foreign policy and larger global issues to the minds of young Indonesians and the youthful Dino has a huge fan following among young people which I always envy. He was an eminent contributor to my book on setting an agenda for India and Indonesia called Masala Bumbu and he was the chair of the India Indonesia eminent persons group from the Indonesian side, which made great suggestions, most of which of never got implemented. That is the fate of all such committees. Today, 
Dinapati Jalal will talk to us about the Asian century, the rise of Asia. And as Dr. Harish said, we are always in the Asian century. Believe you me, this is an Asian century and perhaps the next one too. So initially the Asian century was an economic concept, but more and more it has become a strategic concept and what happened with the end of the Vietnam War in 1975, this contention among powers has returned to Asia. So today we have not only a locomotive of economic growth, but we have severe contention because the rise of China, what we in India believe the aggressive rise of China is unsettling traditional boundaries and creating avenues for new partnerships. In this, ASEAN remains central to everybody. They are the doyen of everybody's eyes. And all of us think that ASEAN centrality will very soon move to ASEAN responsibility. With those few words, I'm going to let it be there and pass the floor to Ambassador Dinopati Jalal for his keynote address to inaugurate the Rising Asia series of annual diplomatic lectures. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Gurdjit Singh. And uh, we miss you in Jakarta, we really do. Uh, my wife uh, sends her best to you and Guru and hope to see you soon. And also, uh, I want to say on behalf of FPCI members how much uh, our heart uh, pains to see what is happening in India now. You know, there's a lot of Indian in Indonesia, uh, Indian uh, Bollywood uh, films, telenovela are being watched by millions of Indonesians every day. Indian food, Indian uh, music, uh, we call it dangdut, you know. So, you know, there, there's a soulful relationship between Indonesia and India, and it really hurts us to see the trouble that you are having uh, with the COVID pandemic. But we know that you will overcome this, uh, and, and Indonesia uh, is praying for you. Uh, and I think uh, uh, the government uh, is, uh, uh, you know, uh, is supporting all efforts by the Indian uh, government and people to overcome this uh, this crisis. Uh, so, you know, about me, uh, you know, I'm 56 years old, uh, three young kids, uh, and like Gurjit and many of you here, uh, we have the privilege to pass through two centuries and two millenniums. You know, there are not many people who can who can claim that. Yeah, passing through two centuries and and two millenniums. Uh, you know, I was born at the height of the Cold War in '65, and all my life until retirement, I had the pleasure to watch uh, ASEAN uh, grow as a regional organization. And then, uh, I retired five years ago. I formed the Foreign Policy Community of Indonesia, and you know, the reason why we did it because I saw so much xenophobia uh, in Indonesian, especially among the young people. Uh, and narrow nationalism and ultra nationalism and i thought that uh, you know, this was not a good thing uh, and when we formed the uh, foreign policy community of indonesia we strongly pushed back against these trends against xenophobia uh, against ultra nationalism and narrow nationalism and surprisingly the responses had been very good people come in in thousands and tens of thousands to our lectures because uh, they find our lectures uh, uh, inspiring and allows them to see the world in the way uh, that should be seen. Uh, the world is not a threat, but it's an opportunity. The world is not an enemy, but our friend. Right? So uh, that's been our work at the foreign policy uh, community. Uh, but uh, I have to tell you that uh, it, it is an uphill battle because uh, you know if you look at indonesian youtube uh, and social media uh, people who advocate uh, these ultra nationalist and uh, xenophobic messages are getting millions of hits right because the more sensationalist it is the more they're getting hits uh, and the more the messages spread uh, i don't know about india but in indonesia that has been the case and and uh, to be honest, that's not 
uh, healthy and you know that is why we are pressing on with uh, our work uh, at the foreign policy community of Indonesia to, to spread positive nationalism and uh, robust uh, internationalism right? uh, I should also add that I'm a COVID survivor uh, I had it in September and uh, now uh, I have my two uh, vaccine shots and uh, I think that the, the best realization after that is that uh, uh, you know I'm, I'm more fearless now uh, when, when I see the world uh, when, when fighting for climate change or human rights or events in Myanmar and so on uh, you know, I fight with the attitude that, look, you have only a few years left, you know, you have to give it your best uh, to help to set uh, things right. So so that's just a couple of things uh, about me and uh, the topic today is about the Asian uh, century. And uh, uh, Mehta was uh, right in saying that, look, uh, out of the last 20 centuries, 18 belong to Asia, right? Uh, and you know I agree with him uh, and I noticed in the literature that there's still some debate whether or not the 21st century will be the Asian century or not Indonesians believe so I think uh, many Indian Indians also believe so but there are those who believe that uh, that's not going to be it's not going to happen yeah. so there's still some debate about that but uh, what I can say with confidence is that the 21st century will be Asia's best century Right. Yeah, it may not be, or it may be Asia's the Asian century, but it certainly will be Asia's best century compared to the previous 18 centuries. Right. Now, why why do I say this? Uh, you know, I say this because uh, if you look at uh, Indonesian uh, history, for example, and maybe Indian history as well, um, you know, you see a lot of great kingdoms. Uh, uh, you know, uh, in Indonesia, my. Sriwijaya, uh, Majapahit, and, and and so on and so on. Yeah. Uh, great armies, great conquests, and everything, right? But uh, it's 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 not a solid uh, 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 societies. Yeah, uh, in in the sense that you know about the elite, the kings, the princes, right, uh, and the generals, right? But uh, the people were weak. Uh, the people were poor. Uh, people were illiterate. There were no institutions, and you hardly hear about how in these uh, kingdoms uh, they treated their own people. Did they respect the people? Did they educate the people? And in most cases, no. Yeah. So uh, in in these 18 centuries, you had a lot of glories. You know, uh, a lot of glories of conquests uh, by by the kingdoms. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it, there were not strong nations, yeah, uh, with strong individuals, strong societies, strong institutions, right? And this is what is different about the Asian century in the in, in the twentieth century, right? Uh, sorry, in the twenty first century, uh, because um, the, the texture is very different, right? Uh, I mean, I come from a family which broke generations of poverty, right? Because my father for many generations their life had not changed social mobility was stuck until my father uh, found education uh, and then he became a diplomat and then uh, lines of poverty were broken uh, uh, by, by by his action and across asia everywhere uh, you see the same things uh, you see uh, uh, political and, and economic reforms uh, you see uh, uh, entrepreneurialism that is producing uh, uh, business people, uh, s small, medium enterprises. Uh, and I think the most important is uh, you see a lot of people getting educated, right? Getting uh, graduating out of high school and also university degrees, right? And, and this is very important because uh, if you're poor, but you're educated, you get a university degree, you immediately switch to the middle class. Right, even though if you're poor, right, uh, and uh, you uh, you know immediately open up uh, a lot of uh, uh, possibilities, and you feel empowered, right, and immediately you feel that you have uh, social uh, and economic uh, mobility, right. Um, and in other words, what I see in Indonesia, and I'm sure in in many other Asian countries, is that uh, the countries grow, the econ economies grow, but the individuals 
uh, grow. Uh, more and more individuals become empowered uh, individuals with uh, some degree of social uh, economic uh, mobility, right? So this is why I think the 21st century will be Asia's uh, best uh, century, right? Uh, and and uh, I think uh, when you look at what happens in Indonesia and India, uh, 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 this is uh, uh, what you see, right? Uh, and uh, you know, I think it's important because when countries grow in their power, uh, they they tend to think and and act uh, uh, differently. You know, the texture of the country uh, becomes different, and the way they see the world and engage the world uh, become different, right? Um, so this is what how I see the 21st century uh, uh, countries growing uh, uh, and their power grows. Yeah, uh, and and what is different this time is the position of the individuals in those societies uh, that that are uh, rising. Uh, and you know, obviously, the growth will be uneven. You know, between countries and also within countries. But what is important uh, is that for for these countries, uh, they, they are changing relative not to the West, right? Uh, don't compare them to America or the, uh, Europe, but uh, they are changing for the better relative to their own past, right? Uh, relative to their own past. And this is, uh, I think, one of the most dramatic uh, uh, things that we will see in, in, the Asia, uh, uh, in, in, in Asia. Now, why is this important? Uh, it's important because uh, as countries grow, their power grows, their economies grow, uh, that leads to a phenomenon of uh, confidence, you know, of entitlement, you know, uh, of ambition, right? And and some even want to exercise leadership, you know, maybe China, maybe India, or Indonesia, right? And and we see this all the time when countries grow. There's always some degree of entitlement that follows uh, with it. You know, we see this happening in Imperial Japan, right? We see this what happens uh, in China. Uh, once China rises, it develops uh, a much stronger sense of uh, entitlement. Uh, we see this uh, in, in Korea as well. We see this in small Singapore, uh, only 4 million people, uh, but uh, they definitely are punching above their weight uh, diplomatically. Uh, we see this in my country, in Indonesia, uh, you know, which uh, we see ourselves now as a regional power uh, in, in Southeast Asia, right? And I think uh, definitely this is also true for India, uh, which, uh, you know, every time I ask an Indian friend, do you consider yourself a major power? You know, they say, uh, no, no, we are, uh, they quote uh, Foreign Minister Jay Shankar, you know, which is an enlightened uh, power, right? Uh, but however you define it, um, more and more countries will want space, uh, diplomatic and political and strategic space and economic space, and more and more countries will want uh, respect. Yeah? Uh, and uh, you know they don't like to be the receiving end of sanctions. Uh, they want a seat at the table. Uh, they don't want to be told uh, what to do, uh, uh, and so on. Right. So. Uh, my point is uh, countries will grow, will, will grow, the power will grow, uh, and the sense of entitlement uh, will grow. And I think this will uh, uh, shape uh, the, the, the Asian century, right? Uh, but, you know, look, for me, the biggest question is how many relationships will change along with this trend, right? I mean, the 20th century was stubborn with uh, relationships that are conflictual and that are still going on today. You know, uh, the relationship between India and Pakistan uh, remain um, marked by tension, uh, China and Japan, uh, US and China, you know, North Korea and South Korea uh, and other relationships. And I think these will go on for quite some time. But you know, I wanna say that there's been wonderful stories in Asia where enmity turns to amity. Right, uh, and again, I want to refer to the case of uh, you know Indonesia. Right, yeah, Indonesia used to really hate Malaysia. You know, uh, we used to really hate Singapore. Uh, we had a policy of confrontasi against them. We wanted to bury them. We wanted to destroy them. We didn't think they had the right to exist. 
as as a nation. Right? But uh, now, what happens uh, now? Uh, Singapore and Malaysia are very close neighbors of Indonesia and a member of the ASEAN family. Right? We used to also also uh, have uh, conflictual relations with Timor Leste, yeah, uh, East Timor. You know, this they had a we had a referendum and they split from Indonesia, uh, and it's just the, the situation was just very bad between the two countries. We didn't want to do anything with with uh, each other for about two years, right? But after that, uh, things uh, became better, and now we have uh, the best relations uh, among among neighbors, right? Uh, China also. Uh, China, uh, at some point, uh, we froze diplomatic relations with them uh, uh, as a result of the abortive coup in 1965. And for about uh, 20 years or so, 27 years, 22 years, uh, we froze uh, diplomatic relations with China. and. We turn our back uh, on China, but then uh, we reestablish uh, relations with China, and now China is a strategic partner. Yeah, uh, Vietnam also. Uh, I remember we were very uh, concerned about the war in Vietnam and worried that uh, communist Vietnam would, like a domino, fall into Indonesia, and and uh, a lot of us were were. were uh, scared of that uh, possibility, but uh, now uh, that is no longer, and Vietnam is a member of the the uh, ASEAN family. I think the point I want to say is that in in all these cases, somehow we were able to evolve a degree of uh, strategic trust. Yeah, uh, somehow strategic trust developed um, with uh, Singapore, with Malaysia, with Timor Leste, uh, with China to some degree uh, with Vietnam uh, and so on. And, and what it took was uh, leadership, uh, leaders who took political risks uh, and leaders who had uh, political will to do so. Um, a, a great sense of opportunism uh, in a good way. Yeah, uh, A good way, a good dose of diplomatic imagination, a good dose of pragmatism and also a forward looking attitude. Right, which is very difficult in many cases because uh, sometimes the history is so bad that it's hard to heal the wounds, right? Uh, and it also took a lot of patience and uh, persistence. And we were able to develop all these strategic trusts without compromising our sovereignty and uh, without developing alliance systems or entering into alliance uh, systems, right? So. You know, if you look at ASEAN, Southeast Asia, I think this is one of the most important uh, transformations. Uh, and, and the formula in ASEAN is about uh, political diversity and, and not uniformity. Uh, meaning, you know, unlike EU, if you want to join EU, you have to be free market and you have to be a democracy and you have to have uh, a high degree of respect for, for human rights. Yeah. But for, uh, in, in, in ASEAN, uh, you can be different political systems, but as long as you espouse to the uh, uh, principles of ASEAN as contained in ASEAN Declaration uh, and also the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation, and you belong in Southeast Asia, then you're in, right? So, so that's what it takes uh, uh, for, for ASEAN. But ASEAN does have one problem. Uh, what is the problem? It, well, not problem, a challenge. Uh, the challenge is that even after all these decades, ASEAN is having a problem grassrooting, uh, meaning that uh, uh, a large number of citizens in ASEAN countries know about ASEAN, know the name, right? But they're not touched by ASEAN activities, right? When they ask uh, what is the ASEAN economic community, they don't know what it is, right? Uh, uh, so, so uh, and a lot of the economic activities are, are still, uh, uh, you know, uh, far away from, from, from ASEAN. I mean, from Indonesia, for example, uh, only about 12 of our provinces trade with ASEAN. Uh, and, and the rest of them, you know, 24 of them uh, have no trade whatsoever with ASEAN, even though they're just next door, right? Uh, and and uh, if you ask uh, students in universities, uh, what do you know about ASEAN economic community or ASEAN community? Uh, a majority of them would say we don't know, 
right? So, so ASEAN biggest challenge is really to become a people-centered uh, organization, uh, which is the the goal of of, of, of ASEAN. Yeah, uh, but uh, but it hasn't been uh, achieved to its fullest extent, right? But the ASEAN experience is important because it proved that nationalism and regionalism can go along. It proves that regionalism can be a powerful force for order, stability, and cooperation. Uh, and it proved that regionalism can be manufactured, you know, just like in Europe. Uh, and, and regionalism can make a huge difference uh, in regions such as Southeast Asia that was once deeply divided and at war. Uh, it also proves that uh, it is possible to establish uh, a functioning regional order uh, in Southeast Asia uh, where uh, the, the regional countries know what they're supposed to do, how they're supposed to relate with one another, and countries outside, China, United States, India, Australia, Japan, uh, are able to engage uh, the, into the, with the region uh, by respecting the fact that ASEAN is the driving force, right? And, and by signing on to rules, which is the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation, uh, which is set by ASEAN, right? You know, I, th I think this is the only place in the Asia uh, where this is uh, this is happening, right? Uh, and and what is interesting also about the, this ASEAN regional order is that the biggest country, which is Indonesia, is not the dominant country, right? Uh, there is a sense of equality uh, in how Indonesia deals with the smallest country, even uh, Brunei or Singapore, right? So it's very unique. A regional order that we have in in Southeast Asia, and as I look at Asia, uh, the wider Asia, the question is, where else can this regionalism work uh, in in Asia? Uh, can it work in South Asia? Uh, and as you all know, of course, uh, it hasn't worked well in 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 Southeast uh, in in South Asia. Uh, can it work in in Northeast Asia? And the answer is no, it has not worked uh, at all uh, in in Northeast Asia, in Central Asia not really right uh so uh emulating the asean experience in other parts of uh, asia have proved to be uh, difficult and of course you have to answer a lot of questions is there a political will to do so is there enough imagination you know where do you begin you know who will take the lead yeah. and how do you develop uh, the structure that you already have for example but can't uh can't evolve uh, that much more right you know, we don't have the answer to this. I don't have the answer. But if you're looking for ideas and inspiration, you know, do look at Southeast Asian uh, example. But the one thing about regionalism is that it is a bottom-up process. You know, countries in that region uh, have to want it, and the countries in that region have to build it uh, from the ground up. Right. So uh, I think we are still very far from reaching an all-encompassing Asia-wide order. Uh, and I think for now, we need to settle for an Asian order made of scattered building blocks with different and sometimes overlapping members and serving different purposes, right? So I think that that uh, picture of uh, Asian order, uh, a very mixed ones, uh, is still going to be around for, for quite some time. Right? Uh, but but of, of those building blocks, uh, one that, as you know, that is uh, rapidly developing is the Indo-Pacific, right? And uh, it's a new concept. Uh, it denotes a vast geographical area, but still an unsettled one. You know, uh, I'm looking at the, what is the geographic definition of the Indian Indo-Pacific concept or the American or the Australian uh, or the Indonesian and so on. And you come up with different uh, geographical uh, uh, definition, right? So, so the geographical scope is still an unsettled one, right? Uh, but it is definitely a geopolitical concept, uh, and uh, it is a concept in progress. Uh, there are Foreign Minister Wang Yi has said, for example, that it's not going to stay around very long. You know, uh, this is like. Uh, I forget what uh, the anecdote he said. Something, the the thing on the ocean that changes all the time, right? Uh, and that remains to be seen. But uh, no one can deny that Indo-Pacific uh, has gained 
a great deal of traction uh, in recent years. Uh, it has been adopted by ASEAN countries, uh, by India, uh, by the United States, by Japan, uh, by Australia, uh, uh, by uh, European countries, uh, and so on. So, so it's, it's gaining more currency, right? Uh, and there's a few significance to the, the concept. Uh, uh, one is, is the maritime driven concept. Uh, uh, you know, it seems that the definition is not about the whole of Asia, but it, this is about the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean and the countries, riparian countries surrounding it, right? So uh, it is a maritime driven concept, like what the ASEAN outlook says that the Indian and Pacific Oceans are not contiguous they are integral uh, part of uh, the, the, the Indo-Pacific. Uh, the other significance is that uh, the United States is a part of the Indo-Pacific, right? And I need to say it because there's some earlier definition of Indo-Pacific that stated that uh, that did not include the United States as part of the Indo-Pacific, right? Uh, but uh, as the concept evolve, um, uh, some countries say that the Indo-Pacific includes the United States, meaning the West Coast of the United States, right? Uh, and the United States itself uh, regards itself as an Indo-Pacific power, right? And in, in fact, he has renamed the Pacific Command to the Indo-Pacific Command, right? So, so uh, that that part is is uh, worthy of note, uh, but. Also, uh, the other significance geopolitically is that Indo-Pacific means that the weight of India is now added to the East Asia or Asia Pacific concept, right? Um, because, you know, it's not about Pakistan or Bangladesh joining the Indo-Pacific, right? Uh, although I think it should be because it is after all an inclusive process, right? Uh, but the significance of it geopolitically is that uh, India, the weight of India uh, is now placed uh, with the dynamics going on in, in the, uh, East Asia, right? Uh, so, so geopolitically, that is uh, the, the thing to be, to be underlined. Right? But, you know, Indo-Pacific does have uh, its challenges. Uh, there are different interpretations of the Indo-Pacific. And there are different strategic intentions to the Indo-Pacific. And this is reflected in the fact that there are different labels uh, to the uh, Indo-Pacific. Uh, the Indians and the Americans use the label uh, free and open Indo-Pacific, also the Japanese and the, the, the Australians. Right? Now, uh, the biggest question uh, is whether Indo-Pacific uh, by some countries is seen as a geopolitical construct to marginalize China or to contain China or with China in mind, right? Uh, again, different countries may have different uh, response uh, to it, right? But I think the American uh, strategy, the American Indo-Pacific strategy under Trump, uh, at least, seem to point in that direction, right? I mean, we, we remember how when uh, there was a quad meeting uh, in Tokyo and Secretary Pompeo came uh, at the end of 2019, uh, in public statement, everything was about China. You know, he would attack China uh, very strongly and so on. And he did it at the quad meeting in Tokyo, right? Uh, so uh, the impression was uh, the, the, the quad interpretation of the Indo-Pacific uh, was such that it was an anti-China uh, geopolitical construct. Right? And the labeling also, uh, the free and open, you know, uh, in my conversations with some friends in Washington before, uh, you know, when I said, what do you mean by free, right? Uh, and you mean free democracy, right? Uh, 
And that notion was confirmed, right? So it was free and open uh, in a way that China is not in, 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 in their view, right? <coughs> so if you use that definition, then the Indo-Pacific is not just a geopolitical uh, concept, but it's also a political concept, right? Uh, and the point is that uh, some countries are not comfortable with this, right? Uh, we believe that for any regional order, regional concept to have long staying power, it has to be open and include everybody and not have a design to exclude any power, right? Uh, especially uh, a major power, right? So uh, this is why if you look at the Indonesian and ASEAN concept of Indo-Pacific, it's a bit different than say the American one. Yeah, the American keeps talking about the free and open Indo-Pacific, yeah. Uh, but on the Indonesian ASEAN side, yes, uh, we refer to free and open, but we stress more on the inclusive side of it, right? Uh, we stress more on the cooperation side and not on the competition uh, side of it. Right? So, uh, uh, you know, we believe if Indo-Pacific is going to grow, it can't isolate or exclude any of the major power. And in this case, uh, it is China, right? Uh, and obviously, until now, uh, you know, China just is not comfortable with Indo-Pacific and it is very resistant uh, of it. Uh, I think uh, my feeling is that uh, uh, China is not also comfortable with the rules-based aspect of the, in, uh, the Indo-Pacific uh, definition. And that puts it into uh, you know, a different position than ASEAN because ASEAN used the term rules-based uh, Indo-Pacific uh, because we want there to be, uh, you know, um, solid rules and, and, and solid norms that guide uh, the interactions uh, in, in, in Asia, right? Uh, but, uh, but that remains uh, the, the case now. Uh, it's still an evolving concept. Uh, and, you know, ASEAN is watching very closely that uh, Quad is uh, taking a very strong, uh, what do you call it, uh, a, a strong role uh, on the Indo-Pacific, yeah? uh, lifting it to the leaders uh, level uh, as had happened uh, a few months ago, uh, uh, although they did it uh, virtually, right? Uh, what is important is uh, for the Quad, uh, they always need, they should always need to uh, pay attention to ASEAN sensitivity uh, regarding the centrality of ASEAN in this. Yeah, uh, I think there are some in ASEAN who are worried that uh, the Quad uh, would be uh, uh, would be taking uh, actions ahead of ASEAN. Yeah, uh, and that ASEAN doesn't want. Uh, ASEAN wants to be on the driving seat uh, of the Indo-Pacific and uh and uh i think uh and, you know the biggest question now is what is relationship between quad and asean you know and, uh, it's uh it's uh it's an open question uh but uh, definitely for for asean asean needs to be or wants to be uh at the driving seat uh to maintain its centrality uh in the indo-pacific right let me now talk a little bit about china you know because uh, uh I know China is a, a, a big issue, and uh, you know, for us in Southeast Asia, definitely, if you ask me, what is the most important uh, geopolitical development uh, in Southeast Asia in the last decade or two? Uh, it is definitely the inroad of China. Yeah, China's engagement with the uh, with the region, right? And uh, they came in not by hard power, but uh, using uh, soft power. Uh, uh, using uh, uh, economic engagement, um, uh, social engagement, you know, a lot of students uh, exchanges uh, and, and, and so on. Uh, 
so uh, diplomatically, uh, I think one of the most significant uh, growth uh, in ASEAN relation has been with China. Right? Uh, in contrast with where China was, uh, say, 30 years ago, oh, sorry, 40 years ago, right? So, so, uh, so that China is the most important geopolitical development in Southeast Asia in the last 20 years. And, and somehow China has also become the most uh, impactful country to uh, Southeast Asians. Um, I mean, we, uh, my organization had a poll on this, a survey, and we asked which country is the most impactful to Indonesia, the most cons consequential. And in the last several years, the answer had always been the United States. But uh, when we did that survey for the first time, the Indonesian public said uh, it's China, right? And when we asked them what country would be the most consequential in the next 10 years, uh, the previous answer had always been the United States, but now the answer is China, right? Now, it doesn't mean they're comfortable with it, right? Uh, it doesn't mean that everybody likes China, but they all recognize that uh, now uh, China is is just a huge part of uh, our uh, economic uh, economic life, right? And I think most Indonesians, especially the political and economic elite, recognize that no matter how you chart where Indonesia would be, uh, and I believe that a lot of Southeast Asian countries think this way also. Um, how we chart ourselves in the future 10 20 30 years uh, china is always a big part of it you know uh, and of course we see uh, united states there also a big part of it uh, japan also right and you know we hope india will also be a big part of it but definitely uh, uh, people would think yeah, yeah the top two or three countries uh, definitely would be uh, china for our uh, economic uh, uh, future right uh, there's also a feeling that China cannot be contained, right? China's power uh, just will grow uh, across the board, politically, diplomatically, strategically, uh, and, and, and so on. Yeah? Uh, and it's just, uh, it's just not containable. Uh, so the question is, how do we engage uh, a China whose power is rising uh, across, uh, across the board, right? Um, and I think uh, what we see uh, is that Yes, uh, the U.S.-China competition uh, is seen as a strategic rivalry for strategic dominance, uh, perhaps, right? But what we see more on the ground is, is really about competition for political influence, right? Uh, and this is particularly intense in countries around China, right? Uh, so, so, you know, never mind Africa, never mind the Middle East, never mind uh, Europe or Latin America. Uh, I think what China wants is to have political influence and leverage uh, that exceeds the influence and leverage of any other country, uh, the US, Japan, India, or whatever, in these countries that are peripheral to China, yeah. uh, especially especially South uh, East Asia. Right? Um, so, so uh, I think that is the name of the game. Uh, I don't know about strategic dominance, uh, but definitely uh, political influence. Yeah. Uh, China wants to have more than any other country in Indonesia, in Malaysia, in Singapore, in the Philippines, uh, and, 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 and so on, right? And, and I think from Southeast Asian perspective, uh, you know, so, so the United States has a rivalry with China and the United States want uh, you know, so to, to influence Southeast Asia, uh, you know, in such a way uh, uh, to, uh, you know, maybe not to take sides, yeah, but, but to feel uncomfortable with China, right? Uh, and, you know, uh, Trump tried to do this and Biden uh, also, but, uh, you know, to be honest, uh, for Southeast Asian countries, we may have occasional, uh, we may scold China from time to time. Uh, Indonesia does that uh, because we have issues uh, on Natuna uh, uh, waters with, with China uh, and with their other issues uh, as well. 
uh, but uh, you know, I, I think there are few Asian countries that will take up to permanently uh, confronting China, right? Uh, I, I, in, in Southeast Asia, I don't see uh, there's one who will who will want to do that. Yeah, uh, to to uh, to permanently uh, confront uh, China. Uh, although occasionally, as I said, uh, there may be some scolding of China back and forth on 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 certain uh, issues, right? Uh, for Southeast Asian countries, especially for Indonesia, the key thing is now balance, right? Uh, we used to say 20, 30 years ago, the key thing is independence. Yes, strategic independence is important. Uh, Strategic autonomy is key, and we we continue to 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 regard this as priority. But uh, the question of balance has become more important now, right? Uh, so if you are very exposed to China, then uh, we also would like to uh, improve exposure of the United States, right? Uh, so in Indonesian foreign policy in the last. 10 or 15 years, this has been the mindset, right? How do you continuously balance between the exposure to uh, different great powers? And in a way, we see India in that sense too, right? Uh, India is growing uh, power. Uh, India is huge in the Indian Ocean. India is uh, uh, a strong force. Uh, in building the regional architecture and on some global issues, a member of G20 uh, uh, um, and, and so on, right? And uh, with growing Navy, right? A growing military force, right? Uh, and our relationship with India is also seen as a way to balance uh, between our relationship with uh, these uh, uh, great powers, right? Uh, and that is something new for us because we did not see India in that light before, but we see this uh, in uh, in recent times, right? So, uh, so, so that's about China. You know, we don't believe China is an ideological threat, uh, as the United States claim it to be. Uh, I don't think China wants to export communism. Uh, what uh, what is more true, as I said earlier, is China wants to have political influence. Uh, and in fact, they've been very careful about uh, the issue of uh, ideology, right? So there's no question that China will be a huge factor in the 21st century, strategically, diplomatically, economically. But what we don't want uh, is to see a China century, right? We want it to be the Asian century, right? Not the China century, the Asian century with uh, China being, being part of it and with all of uh, Asia uh, rising uh, uh, together, right? Uh, and and for me, what what uh, what I uh, what worry, well, maybe not worry, but what I look at when I see the future of China is Chinese nationalism, right? Uh, what do I mean by it? Uh, yes, China now is uh, says it's peaceful rise, peaceful development, uh, and uh, it's. it's uh, yeah. It's saying the right things, yeah. Uh, the win-win, uh, uh, a new type of uh, power games, uh, shared destiny, and, and and so on, right? But what happens at some point in the future when China's nationalism, one way or another, takes the wrong turn, right? Which is a possibility, right? Uh, when I went to China to discuss things like this, and I ask this particular question, will China's nationalism become hard at some point, right? Everybody says, no, 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 we'll be cool, we'll be calm, <laughs> we'll, you know, we'll be responsible and so on. But seriously, no one can guarantee it, right? Uh, even America, uh, you know, you saw, you, you saw the rise of nationalism, uh, you know, after 9-11, uh, during Trump, uh, and so on and so on. You know, things go up and down. Right, nationalism can sharpen uh, at uh, at different points in time. Right, 
uh, it would happen to Indonesia. I would never say that uh, Indonesia would never develop a hard nationalism or ultra nationalism, uh, and the wrong kind of nationalism. And I'm sure uh, for India, uh, you would not make that 100% bet too. You know, there's always a chance that uh, a nationalism uh, take a certain form that is not uh, healthy, right? Uh, and that's would be my thing to watch on on China. Yeah. Uh, with the Chinese dismiss, but as political scientists, uh, I believe it is a valid uh, question, right? Uh, what happens when China becomes more powerful, uh, more prosperous, stronger, uh, and their nationalism uh, takes on takes on uh, a form that is not uh, uh, that is not healthy, right? Uh, and we've seen that happening with with some other countries. Right? Uh, I don't know how much time I got. Right, uh, Gurjit, how much time do I have? It's okay. Whenever you want to finish, it's fine. Sure. Okay. Uh, just two more points. Uh, one is uh, I've been working a lot on something called the Abrahamic uh, circle, right? Uh, and what I notice is around the world, uh, we are seeing more interfaith tensions, right? Uh, more uh, occurrences of identity politics uh, and religion and politics getting messed up, right? Uh, getting mixed. Yeah. Uh, and the, the, the Abrahamic tension, I noticed that that is uh, something that is happening around the world uh, and getting worse uh, in terms of, you know, you see the rise of Islamophobia in, in Europe, uh, in the United States, in, in parts of Asia and, and so on. And, and I noticed that uh, in the last 1300 years, there has never been a century whereby Muslims, Christians and Jewish people live totally and globally at peace with one another, right? Uh, under, underline the term totally and globally. Uh, so uh, there's always uh, a century whereby Muslims and Christians and Jewish people were at war uh, or, or in conflict with one another. And my worry is in the 21st century, uh, we're not seeing the situation getting any better, right? Uh, I would love to see the 21st century as a century whereby the Abrahamic peace can be attained totally and globally uh, finally, right? But uh, we are not uh, we're not seeing signs of this. And and you know the reason I, I bring this up is because uh, in Indonesia, for example, where we pride ourselves for being a multi-cultural uh, country with religious freedom, uh, in the last elections, religion was an issue, right? Uh, President Jokowi, uh, who won the second term, had to win the second term by proving his Islamic credentials. Right uh, and and political Islam was definitely the main election issue uh, uh, at the most recent elections that we had in 2019, and that is for a country that is the third largest democracy in the world, a country that has religious freedoms, but uh, still at the grassroots you see a lot of uh, you see some degree of uh, what do you call it, frictions uh, at the grassroots between. Uh, uh, Islamic communities and and and, and non-Muslims, right? Uh, in fact, I was surprised to find that uh, there was a study by a presidential office uh, done by Satara Institute, uh, and they found that uh, there were ten most intolerant cities in Indonesia, which included uh, Jakarta, the capital city, right? Uh, and again, this was done by the presidential office, so it has a great deal of credibility. But uh, it surprised me that after so many years, the issues of identity, uh, 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 intolerance, uh, uh, diversity uh, is still there in Indonesia. And, and uh, I think this is true to many other countries, yeah. Yes. Yes, uh, so, so you know, I say this because there, there are more Muslims in, in, in Asia than in the Middle East, right? There are a lot of Muslims in India, in Pakistan, in Bangladesh, in Indonesia, in Malaysia, and in the Philippines. And, and uh, you know, I think, I think this is uh, an issue that, uh, you know, we should uh, pay, pay attention to. And, and obviously the last issue is uh, uh, 
uh, climate, right? Uh, we've been very active at, at PCI to campaign for a net zero world by 2050, right? Uh, and, you know, the problem is that uh, it's hard to awaken public imagination and political responsiveness to the climate threat, right? Uh, the we have only a carbon stock until 2050 to make sure that uh, the global average temperature is below two degrees right and after that uh, we run the risk of going into a world which is uh, four degrees hotter than than, than uh, the, the average and what uh, we see is that uh, for example china emission now is greater than the emission of all developed countries Right, uh, and I think the challenge for us is no longer the emissions from the developed countries, uh, which cause all this, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, greenhouse effects, uh, but how do we make sure that developing countries are part of the solution too, uh, without getting too much into the politics of you did it first, you did it, and who's going to pay for it, and so on, you know. Uh, we, we need to go beyond that, uh, and, and that's why I think a COP26 this year is going to be particularly important. But we can't imagine an Asian century uh, uh, being a place uh, where uh, there's just climate disasters everywhere. I think I read somewhere that uh, India had a record heat wave where uh, at one place, uh, the temperature rose to 123 degrees, right, or 53 degrees Celsius, uh, which is just like hell, right? Uh, and we don't do anything about it, then uh, 2050 uh, is definitely going to be a uh, climate disaster, right? So we can't define uh, a happy and stable uh, 21st century unless uh, uh, Asians really uh, get on with the fight to uh, reduce their emission and achieve uh, a net zero uh, world and hopefully by by 2050 so so i'll end there and 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 uh, i do want to stress uh, that you know there is a paradox that we need to uh, mine for uh, in terms of uh, asian century and the paradox is that you know at a time when asia is becoming a center gravity uh, Asia becomes a greater theater for conflicts and more steep in strategic mistrust, right? Um, so we need to avoid that paradox. Uh, and there's a paradox that at a time when Asia's soft power and smart power rapidly expands, Asia becomes embroiled and, and trapped in, in more hard power uh, things. And that's, that's, that's not, uh, that's never good, right? Uh, and at a time when we are more connected and integrated, Asia becomes more embroiled in divisive and oppressive uh, uh, national, narrow nationalism and identity politics. Uh, and at a time when Asia is potentially reaching its best century, uh, countries in, in our Asia bungle this opportunity and descend into more division, more inward looking attitude uh, and more narrow nationalism. Right? So, so these are, I think, the, the paradoxes that we need to avoid uh, in what could potentially be Asia's uh, best uh, century. So I'll stop there. I know, I know my, my remarks have not been coherent. I'm going all over the place. Uh, but I hope it's uh, useful for you to, to hear the Indonesian perspective. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Dido. Uh, I think uh, you gave us a large swath Mm -hmm. pointing out the many paradoxes and the contradictions, and yet showing where the unity lay. Mm -hmm. Four quick points from what I understood or by comments. One, this has to be an Asian century and not a Chinese century. Mm -hmm. If ASEAN can help in that, we will be grateful. Mm -hmm. Second, China has used free and open, rules-based order, globalization and everything which came with it to try and become a dominant power. Now, these two together can't coexist. Third, the Indo-Pacific and the Quad are reactions to Chinese aggressive intent. They are not 
peacemaking bodies by themselves we had the east asia summit which was adequate till it is moving into irrelevance due to chinese actions four india has decided that the economic integrity of asia can be sacrificed in order to retain its own strategic autonomy unlike asean which talks of strategic autonomy but gives up political gains from china for economic benefit countries like australia japan india and usa suffer from a uh, chinese action and they are resolute in contradicting them i think the court is ready to work with certain asean countries who have the ability but need to show the will and i would name two indonesia and vietnam to come along and say draw the line and say this is where you are and no more but these are not easy questions you pointed out about climate change the trade issues china has taken advantage of everything the world had to offer them and has tried to close the world for others india knows because the amount of covid relief which china has deliberately blocked after accepting money from even indian civil society and not supply stuff is amazing action against what they believe is a recalcitrant india so the asian century at least till the next 25 years is going to be one of contention and not as much peace as we would like i would like to stop there and open the floor for questions Uh, can i have a question quickly yes this my name is dr mahapatra i teach at northeast institute shillong uh, i like to talk very much but i have a simple query with to the ambassador uh, jalal uh, can you do you see any kind of a convergence of views between india and uh, indonesia uh, more particularly when you hint at the point that indonesia's uh, views on indo pacific is more inclusive than uh, it is exclusive as it is being viewed by other countries thank you harish harish dr mehta <clears throat> right i uh, i compliment you uh, ambassador dino on your uh, uh, on the way you drawn the whole argument of the paradoxes and uh, and you know uh, uh, two things that struck me were that can an asean type regionalism work in south asia and other parts of the region and you said it will be difficult uh, in order to, in order to reach an asean type of regionalism and you pointed out the stumbling blocks do you not think that unless uh, south asia northeast asia and central asia can arrive at some kind of an asean type regionalism or a consensus that unless these things happen an asian century will remain distant because after all you cannot only have asean as the role model and the others sort of uh, you know uh, traveling in their orbits so that's my one question do you know these two questions sir yes uh, first i answer uh, pa mehta's question i i think that uh that's the reality uh on the ground i mean for uh i mean we see sark uh is not uh becoming the vehicle for regionalism in in south asia and, and i think the main problem obviously is the difficult relationship between india and pakistan right and and so long as that persists uh the is is hard to develop a, a strong regionalism and keep in mind in indonesia you know once the relations between indonesia and malaysia change and indonesia and singapore change and the relationship between philippine and malaysia change uh, when malaysia drop sorry philippine dropped the claim to sabah then then things began to evolve in the right direction right but i don't see that ingredients uh, in in the 
in South Asia, the, the structural uh, 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 relations uh, between India and Pakistan is just too deep. The, the, the structural sli split, yeah, uh, and I think it's gonna be around for some time. And uh, same thing with Northeast Asia. We, uh, I mean, it's, it's it's just hard for South Korea, China, and Japan, and Mongolia, uh, and North Korea uh, to develop uh, uh, the kind of regionalism that has developed in in, in Southeast Asia, right? And that will that will continue for some generations, right? So, so I'm afraid that that uh, is going to be uh, operational for for quite some time, uh, and I think that's going to somehow undermine uh, the quality of the Asian century uh, that uh, that we are we are trying to to to, to achieve, right? Um, Uh, uh, question. You know, the India Indonesia relations uh, are changing. It's no longer about non alignment. Yeah. No longer about uh, non alignment. I think now it's more geopolitical. <coughs> uh, I know the Minister of Defense of Indonesia, uh, General Prabowo. Uh, he pays a great deal of attention on on india uh, especially uh uh because he sees uh, uh the indian navy uh as a um, very active and visible presence uh in in the andaman islands and in, in the waters around uh, uh indonesia in the indian ocean yeah um, and uh, he takes notice of the Indian uh, defense uh, industry, uh, for example, uh, and and so on and so on. So, so uh, the geopolitical uh, rationale for Indonesia and India to get closer, and there's already a comprehensive partnership, uh, but but that has become even more obvious these days. Uh, what we uh, uh, it's, it is unfortunate. Uh, what we regret is India not joining part of uh, RCEP, yeah, Re Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. Uh, we really, RCEP would have been much different and much more substantive with India in it uh, than with India outside of it. But you know, uh, we understand the circumstances for India, and we believe that uh, at some point India will will join. Uh, the the the, uh, the the RCEP, right? Uh, but uh, I think Gurjit will also uh, agree with me that the, the toughest nut to crack is the the economic thing, the economic uh, engagement between Indonesia and and India. You know, the, the trade is growing uh, and and so on. You know, uh, and uh, more Indian investments uh, in Indonesia, more Indonesian, more Indian tourists uh, in in Indonesia. Uh, but it's just not growing at the level of China, right? Uh, our trade with China now is about $75 billion, right? And uh, keep in mind, that is three times faster, three times larger than our trade with the United States, right? Our trade with the United States is around 28, 28, 29 billion, and China is 75, and it will soon reach 100 billion, right? So, uh, so our trade, uh, our economic engagement with with India is is really uh, a challenge uh, for 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 uh, both sides. Uh, but but definitely the potential for uh, diplomatic and and strategic uh, 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 engagement is is uh, is strongly there, yeah. and we need to harness that. Yeah. Thank you very much for your. I'm time. good. Any more uh, Yes, sir. Himanshu? Yes, sir. Yes, please, uh, uh, Namaskar, Dr. Dean. Dino, sir. I am a, a student from Indra Gandhi National Tribal University, India. So as you highlight about the uh, non-conscious way of uh, the policy advertisement of Asian in academia, so what is the role of academia and how the academia may promote the 
general values and economical values and you know policies of acn and how it affect the whole academy and the thinking process uh well uh, you know obviously the, the academia is a important part of the policy making process and uh, of the people to people uh, contact right but uh, again uh, uh, here again in terms of indonesia and india right uh, there has been uh, quite a lot of movement uh, relationship between uh, universities uh, but uh, we getting indonesians to study in in india uh, has been uh, also a, uh, uh, you know a, a challenge yeah, i don't know what is the number i think gorjit knows better uh, the, the number right uh, and and vice versa getting more indians to study in in indonesia has been uh, somewhat uh, somewhat somewhat a challenge right but uh, you know obviously the akinimia has a uh, a great role to play uh, in in building uh, the, the relationships uh, between the, the two countries. Uh, uh, and you know, for, for for in Indonesia, I'm I am the uh, chairman of Indonesian Lecturers Association, right? So which means that uh, we have this organization for university uh, lecturers, uh, and and uh, uh, it's. Uh, for some reason is is uh, we having a hard time uh, developing university to university connections uh, even to southeast asia uh, uh, for, you know for, for different uh, for a variety of reasons uh, uh, and and uh, i notice uh, among uh, at least indonesian uh, lecturers uh, they're not as well exposed uh on on global issues uh so and you know gurdjieff knows this very well indonesia is 270 million people but if you want to find uh, foreign policy experts uh you know there's really a handful of them you know there's just uh, uh, not, not too many uh, of them uh, around and that is very surprising you know for a large country such as uh, indonesia um so um yeah i don't know if that answers your question yeah well, you know, uh, just to add to that, Indonesia has 250 students in India, which uh, is really small. Yes, Ethiopia yeah. has a thousand. Yes. Okay? Now, yes. most Indonesians who come to study, study religious studies. Mm -hmm. Either they are at the Gurukul Kangri or mm -hmm. they are at the Madarsa. Very few are actually studying science. Mm -hmm. some into humanities. So India has offered 1,000 scholarships to go to the IITs, to all the ASEAN countries. Now, this is in its second year, second call has gone out, but the response is still slow. Mm -hmm. So I think we are on the right track, but we need more encouragement and enthusiasm. Absolutely. Any more questions? Yeah, one question from Sorry, my you, side, uh, Padino. Uh, you you painted a very very wide canvas, very difficult to cover a century, and very difficult to cover uh, uh, Asia. Uh, you know, if you look at the last century, the twentieth century, and you look at Europe, and you look at how Europe started, and how Europe ended, it's a story in itself. Secondly, to define Asia is so difficult uh, today. You know, there's a West Asia. There is a South Asia, there is a Southeast Asia, and there is a China. I must compliment, compliment you, Pa, on, on really painting on a very wide canvas. Two areas which struck me, which are equally <coughs> important in the next century. Uh, one is the whole issue of food security. Uh, you know, if you look at uh, parts of Asia where the populations are growing, uh, there is... Uh, a problem of equity in food. So food security is going to be also a challenge for the next uh, century. The other one, which I think is a very big one for North Asia, is the aging population. If you look at China, if you look at Japan, these are now becoming uh, aging population. Things won't change in the next 20 years. But if you look at 2050, 
and then you contrast it with what happened in Europe, uh, will China start having to look at migrants? Uh, there will be a, a period of muscular nationalism, of course. You know, they will have to do something about Taiwan to begin with. But there will come a time, say about 2050, 2060, when uh, they will face the same challenges which Europe faced uh, in the last century. What is your view on that? Yeah, well, uh, first on, on food security, uh, you know, I referred earlier about climate change, and I think uh, the next, uh, if we don't get, uh, if we don't control uh, global warming, uh, I think food security is definitely going to be worse. Uh, I think you may be familiar with uh, uh, ice from Himalaya that are melting, uh, and uh, how that will affect. Uh, uh, the flow of water and irrigation uh, in agricultural uh, areas in North India that would affect, I think, some like 500 million people. Yeah. Uh, and I think this is something that is uh, that we so are seeing. Just to interrupt there, yeah, yeah. That's, that's one aspect of the issue. You yes. know, I used to work with Unilever yes. for over 30 years. Yes. One of the things which we found out is if you take the average calorie intake required for mm. a, say adult male mm. it's about 2000 calories per person mm. if you take the entire production of the world today mm. and you divide by the number of people who are there mm. you have 4000 calories per person available mm. but it just doesn't work because of inequity because of distribution systems mm. and now of course global warming so yeah. it's a it's a very big challenge, which uh, has not been tackled yet. Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, totally agree with you. Uh, you know, I I do think that uh, uh, food security will be uh, under threat uh, uh, due to uh, uh, global warming, and then definitely through in in Indonesia we're seeing more a drought. Uh, we're seeing more floods uh, that affect uh, our uh, what do you call it? Uh, our rice paddy fields. Uh, we see more forest fires, uh, not this year, but in previous years, uh, and and so on. Uh, and in fact, uh, the rise of uh, sea temperature by one degree would kill. Um, um, the uh, what do you call it? Uh, the coral reefs, yeah, uh, and that would uh, affect uh, the blue economy in, in Indonesia. So really, uh, this is a, a, a global problem, uh, and uh, I, I, this is why we make the task of uh, uh, net zero world by 2050 a lot more urgent right because we really have only uh, uh 30 years uh to 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 achieve it right and and you know the, the formula is quite simple actually the formula to achieve net zero 2050 uh is uh you reduce emission by 50 percent in the next 10 years and you reduce it again by 50 percent in the next 10 years and then you reduce it again in the next 10 years. So by 2050, you have a, a, a net zero, right? Uh, and I hope India will become a part of that, uh, uh, that global challenge, right? Uh, I think uh, I read someplace uh, you're, you're 7%, is it 7 or 11% of uh, global emission? Uh, and Indonesia is about 3% of uh, global emissions. We have uh, great responsibilities uh, for this, right? Uh, on aging population, uh, you know, uh, definitely uh, share your your concern for Indonesia. You know, we have a young population. I think 50% of our population is below uh, 30 years old. We have a demographic dividend uh, that will only last for another 15 years before our uh, workforce uh, uh, loses that uh, competitive advantage. Uh, but the problem for Indonesia is uh, more than 50% of our workforce uh, have only elementary degrees, right? Uh, 
and uh, that means that uh, a lot of them are going to be uh, not competitive uh, and, and we're going to be wasting our demographic dividend. Yeah, I think uh, it may be the same uh, case in, in uh, India uh, in India as well. But soon we'll get there. Soon uh, our population will start aging, just like uh, the population of China, uh, Japan, and, 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 and Korea uh, again. And you know, this is why uh, President Jokowi has uh, stressed on the need for... Uh, uh, human development as the priority uh, for his administration. So not just infrastructure uh, and so on, but but uh, uh, human uh, resource development, especially on on education. But COVID sort of messed up everything uh, for for Indonesia. Right? So I saw Ambassador Navareka Sharma here. Is she here? And would she like to comment? A former ambassador to Indonesia. Ambassador Navreka Sharma. I have her book, by the way. So, mm, a wonderful book. Yes. I don't hear her. Okay. Maybe okay. we have to request her to un unmute. Yes, Ambassador can, Navreka can Sharma. Yes. Can you hear me now? Can you? Yes, ma'am. We can hear you. Welcome. Oh. Good of you to join well, us. I'm. I'm very happy to see old friends again. Dino, it's really nice to see you after a long time. And Thank you. Um, I've loved listening to what you had to say. I'm so glad that you are really, as it were, on the ball. It's really very nice to, 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 to watch you. And good with you too. But I don't have anything to contribute, I'm afraid. I'm just watching and fascinated to listen to what you have to say. If I have something, I will think, cogitate, and I will send you an email. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Mathur. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. So I think uh, we can now uh, conclude this annual, first annual diplomatic distinguished lecture by Ambassador. Um, so. I'm sure you'll all agree it has been a fascinating toward the horizon. And this horizon is going to keep changing. The sun will keep rising in the east. But the wave will not be easy to traverse. So I think, uh, Dino, one of the things we can take away from this, and thanks for your participation, is that perhaps we can look at a collaboration between the Rising Asia Journal and the FPCI. And we can get more what we talked about, connecting younger people and academics. Perhaps we can arrange something between ourselves to do something where we connect the younger people of FPCI through the RAJ and also academic and perhaps do a conference in the near future. I leave that thought to you um, and I hand back to our chairman, uh, Dr. Harish Mehta. I think it's been a very, very illuminating uh, experience listening to Ambassador uh, Dr. Dino and, uh, and learning from him. Uh, several aspects which uh, have enlightened me. I mean, you know, some of the things that he talked about, he took us back to, he took us back to uh, things like the, uh, the uh, confrontasi, for example, you know, how ASEAN overcame its initial, uh, its initial uh, hangups about uh, you know, the intra-ASEAN rivalries that existed, which were again a throwback to the colonial era. And, and, and within that, the way Indonesia has worked with Singapore and Malaysia to end confrontasi holds important messages, not just in South Asia, but in the wider North Asia and, and North Asia's Diplomatic interactions with South Asia are also embedded within that narrative that uh, Ambassador Dr. Dino has wonderfully brought out, as well as his need for the Indo-Pacific as a building block. And the fact that in, most of the countries have different versions of what it is, and the need is pretty quick if we want to get moving, is how... Are we going to bring all these different ideas of the Indo-Pacific 
into one common if if at all that's possible or let them all remain uh, you know uh, each one with their own version of in the indo pacific some overlap is always nice and this would create a diversity of opinions and views but at the end of the day you got to move forward with it so with that i thank you profusely uh, ambassador of dino for coming today and uh, i wholeheartedly support the uh, 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 both the idea mooted by ambassador gurjeet singh and accepted by you to to heighten and tighten uh, the relationship between the foreign policy community of indonesia and the rising asia foundation and the journal and we shall in the coming weeks and days work towards uh, concretizing uh, various uh, programs we can begin working together on so with that i would like to hand over the mic to uh, microphone to uh, professor julie mehta who is a founding a trustee and a board member of the foundation to deliver a <laughs> vote of thanks for the evening to the ambassador dr dino thank you very much everybody i uh, really enjoyed uh, meeting you and and talking to you and oh there you go please dr dino that was a priceless insightful very precious and witty compelling persuasive visionary talk i am particularly thankful to gurjeet that he opened the segue for me and very quickly i'd like to say that as post colonial scholars who are present here today um in large numbers some of them are my post graduate students we totally understand where you're coming from the issue of nationalism the issue of ultra nationalism and your abrahamic peace accord that you were speaking of we are familiar with that and i think you have added so many rich pickings to the subject of the asian century the paradoxes the challenges and the possibilities and the promises your a uh, particular idea of brokering of individual identity individual empowerment through growth and economic uh, enhancement in asia i think is a point very well taken you have made references that the younger generation will uh, immediately connect with the idea of interference geopolitical morphology and um the idea of security uh, of states so interdisciplinary multidisciplinary reach with a huge canvas as origit pointed out mr origit kosh thank you very much for that and gurjeet what can i say my dear old friend what a spell binding uh take of the four points that you made from dr dino's talk uh, as usual you pulled in all the threads together i would like to also thank the uh, raj and the raf team members many of them are my students who dedicate their time and their efforts and their interests the advisory board the copy editors young and dedicated and particularly mohini pradhan who has demonstrated her whiz uh, with technology and she's always uh, helped us with our uh, virtual meetings so thank you again everybody for being here i hope we can take away something that will make us think about the possibility of a very successful 21st asian century thank you dr dino and thank you so much kurti thank you dino okay well thank you julie thank you harish and thank you everybody else thank Great you start. wish you thank all the best for tomorrow thank, thank you for being here thank you. thank you thank you everyone good night good night Thank you.